I'm sorry, my computer went in standby. Uh, so this is the first time that happened. I don't hope that uh, this is now, uh, we'll be repeating all the time now. Okay, so let's restart. Um, the, the goal is to make the whole thing a little bit more tomographic. And uh, that somehow means we need to have uh, measurements around a, an object. So we want to have ultrasound measurements around an object. And uh, you see that there's probably not too many um, not too many objects that can be investigated because the ultrasound needs to go through. And for example, if you do it for the breast or for the uh, for the chest, then um, then uh, the ultrasound will just not really get through to the other side. So you need something that's soft. And uh, one of the uh, only objects that you come up with is the female breast. And there's, uh, in fact, there's an interesting goal there because what you would like to do is uh, you would like to aid in detecting breast cancer and try to uh, try to aid mammography or to replace mammography with uh, ultrasound or similar devices. And uh, the reason is that uh, definitely for ultrasound, you want to get rid of the X-ray load um, because this is just a preliminary um, examination. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant to, to have a mammography. So many women don't do it. And uh, yeah, so it would be really beneficial to have a simple replacement for that and a cheap one as well, of course. Okay, so uh, we aided in uh, designing a device uh, that was supposed to do that uh, with a uh, um, engineering company from Salt Lake City who unfortunately went broke because it turned out that the device was not as cheap and as simple to build as we had envisioned. However, I want to show you uh, the video that they made and that they that shows us the design. So this is the idea. Um, the breast hangs in a tank of water. I mean, you'll have to take the measurements all around the breast. That's my favorite part when it makes plop. And then you take ultrasound measurements around the breast. So uh, one of uh, the um, there's transducers in both of these uh, yeah, these blocks over here. So you send an ultrasound pulse in and you measure the reflected and the transmitted wave. So you can somehow measure everything around the, the complete sound uh, wave around the object. And that should be something that should definitely be helpful for an inverse problem and we will look at this now. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, um, so uh, the idea, we want to make ultrasound uh, specific. Uh, so uh, of course you can look at a breast also with normal ultrasound, but the thing is that uh, you can only tell there's something in there. And uh, it turns out that there's a lot going on in a female breast. So uh, that's not very helpful. You must be specific. So if you want to detect cancer, you really must be able to say what it is and not there's something down there. OK, we restrict all of our uh, views to 2D, which isn't true, but uh, which is OK in a way, just to make things a little bit more simple. OK, uh, the first idea is uh, that we're not sending in pulses, but that uh, we are looking at the incoming waves, so the pulse, uh, the, so the waves that generate the, um, the, the gen we, uh, we look at the generating wave uh, in, um, in a frequency space. So uh, we assume that the waves coming in and that produce the images and that produce the outgoing waves and so on are uh, of the form e to the i omega t times ui of x. So uh, that should be our incident wave. And e to the i omega t uh, is, is the time dependence, of course, and ui is something like the amplitude in each point. 
Okay, um, now you have an incoming wave uh, and uh, when it hits an object that produces a scattered wave and the scattered wave uh, has the same frequency dependency. So it's also of the form e to the i omega t times us of x. And that's true just looking at uh, the wave equation. Okay, uh, the total wave um, I will al always denote by U, which should be the incident wave plus the produced scattered wave. So UI is my wave, US is the, the wave that is produced by the unknown object. And uh, the total is U, and of course that should satisfy the wave equation. So we should have something like C of X squared, um, Laplacian of U of X and T, again with respect to X, of course, is the second derivative of U with respect to T. Okay, uh, and uh, US is small in some sense. We will get to that later. Okay, uh, now since uh, everything, uh, since this is um, just in, uh, this can be written as e om EI omega t times small u, um, I can just plug this in. And uh, of course, this is with respect to the first derivative. So e to the i omega 2 just stays over here. So uh, plugging in this, uh, this representation of u, we have that uh, since everything is dependent, um, I can take the e to the i omega two, uh, t out. So this is i to e to the i omega t times c of x squared um, Laplacian of e, uh, capital U of x and t uh, um, of x now, because I used this representation over here. And sorry, I had to recollect myself. Um, now, this is what is uh, satisfied by the wave equation. Now, since u is ui plus us, and both ui and us can be written in the form of e to the i omega t times ui plus us, uh, I said small u equal to ui plus us, and I received that the Laplacian of u uh, which is um, C, C of x squared times the Laplacian of u is the same as the second derivative of this one with respect to t. So that's minus omega squared times e to the i omega t times ui of x. And uh, now taking the i omega t out, it's on both sides and dividing by C of x squared and taking this to the left-hand side, we have that Laplacian of u plus omega squared over C of x squared times u is zero. And we need some boundary condition and I'll not go into detail about that. Uh, we have a radiation condition at infinity, which makes a lot of problems in the numerical implementation, but uh, I'll just, Notice here there's some boundary condition at infinity. Okay, uh, now denoting this one over here, so omega squared over C of x squared as k of x squared, we finally arrive at the Helmholtz equation Laplace u, Laplacian of u plus k of x squared times u equals zero. And I should have this somewhere. So finally, we have that the uh, that the small u, the amplitude which I had over there, satisfies this equation. Okay. Um, now the problem with this equation is that uh, it's uh, not you know um, it's not elliptic or some something. It's of a mixed type, and uh, it turns out it uh, it has positive and negative eigenvalues, and uh, the problem with that is that it's numerically quite hard to solve and I'll propose something for that uh, on the lecture in the lecture on Monday. Okay, uh, but let's look at that uh, and assume for a second that C of X is constant. Uh, um, so uh, there's no object at all. We just have the vacuum, empty space, and then there should be no scattered wave. 
So uh, that means that in that case, us is zero and ui should now uh, satisfy this equation. So uh, if c of x is constant, uh, then k is also constant as well. And ui should satisfy the equation Laplacian of ui plus k squared ui is zero. Okay, so uh, we only have um, a limited choice of incoming waves because they need to satisfy that Helmholtz equation. And one that is usually used, the model that is usually used is uh, we use parallel incoming waves. So uh, we use a wave of the form ui of x uh, as e to the i k x times theta. And uh, where theta is in S1, a unit vector, and uh, if you look at this, then this is just a parallel way that this is a wave in direction uh, theta, which is constant in direction theta perp. So it looks like a wave coming from here in direction theta. So that's uh, how you can imagine this. Okay, and that can and that are exactly the waves that are approximately generated by the device that uh, I just showed you. Now the tomographic idea, of course, is uh, self-evident, right? I mean, we uh, we have the unknown object over here, which is characterized more or less by its sound speed, and uh, we have an incoming wave coming in from this direction. We let it radiate through the unknown object, uh, through, uh, through the unknown object, and measure the scattered wave behind and. Um, before the object. So we measure both reflected and transmitted waves and we try to regain the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, we try to measure the sound speed from these measurements. We try to get the sound speed from these measurements. And of course, I do not only do that from one, di uh, from one direction, as you saw, we're moving the whole measurement device around. So uh, we have, uh, we have measurements from many sides and um, from all sides. Okay, uh, so um, we're trying to reconstruct a medium from its scattered wave, and that's what's usually known as an inverse scattering problem. And uh, as I just described it, there are many, many ways of actually um, setting this up. And this is one of the more well-known forms of formulating it. Okay, um, there's one problem connected to this, and um, let me mention it. Um, the unknown quantity, of course, what we're going for is the sound speed, and uh, um, the uh, the sound speed depends on k, or the other on the other hand, uh, other way around. The k that we had in the Helmholtz equation depends on c. So if we have the k, then we have the c. So we are going to replay. We are going for the reconstruction of this k. The problem is that um, for for example for the radon transform, we always used that the support of the unknown function was inside the body, and we would like to do that here as well. But uh, outside of the body, we assume there's vacuum, so there's a constant sound speed, but it's not zero, of course. And so we have something like a differential sound speed. So uh, say, um, since the sound speed is constant outside of the object, uh, k is constant outside of the object, and um, we write k of x squared as k squared. So, and that should be the k outside of the body, which is constant. And inside, there is a small contrast. And that contrast I denote by 1 plus q of x. And again, of course, if I can reconstruct q, then uh, I can reconstruct k, and then I can also reconstruct c of x. Okay, now uh, outside of the body, uh, this is one over here. So outside of the body, so the, so, uh, the uh, Q is zero. So the port support of Q is inside the body. And that's the deviation of the sound speed. And that's what we're going for. Okay, now uh, we have a measurement operator. And um, let me set this up. Uh, so we measure the scattered wave for a given in incident wave with direction theta. And we assume that we that was not completely true from, from the video, but anyway, we measure it on a circle 
around the object. So, and uh, for simplicity, for simplicity, we assume that uh, the object is again embedded in a circle of radius one. So uh, we measure the scattered wave on the unit, so on the uh, boundary of the unit circle. Okay, so uh, what we actually have is a measurement vector and um, that uh, measures our function Q. So that's a function on K1 of uh, um, K1 of zero. So it's the, uh, it's the function on the interior of the unit circle. And um, it, uh, it, what it gives us is um, a two-dimensional function given by theta and psi. So for a given Q, what we measure is MQ of theta and psi. So that's the scattered wave that was generated by an incoming wave in direction theta, and it's evaluated on the unit circle at psi. Okay, and of course, by u theta s, I denote the scattered wave for the incoming wave ex times theta. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what it is. Okay, um, let's count dimensions. And that's something I usually do to just see if the problem is at all feasible. Uh, theta uh, uh, and psi are on the unit circle, and these are the parameters for the data. So I have two degrees of freedom because they are both on the unit circle. They can only, uh, so that's, these are one dimensional quantities. And um, Q is a two dimensional quantity. So uh, we have two degrees of freedom here and we have a 2D quantity here. So at least the number of dimension matches and there is a chance that we will actually be able to invert. Okay, uh, so let me finally write down once again the Helmholtz equation. We want to find solutions. We are working with um, solutions to the Helmholtz equation, which is Laplace u plus k squared times 1 plus q times u equals 0. And q is a function that we want to, uh, that we want to derive. And u is the sound, sound pressure that has been measured on the unit circle for many incident waves. Um, one of the main problems is that M is uh, that the measurement operator is nonlinear. This is the measurement operator over here. Uh, the thing is that U has to satisfy the um, the Helmholtz equation, and uh, for fixed Q, this is linear in U, and for fixed U, uh, this is linear in Q, almost linear at least. Um, fine linear in Q. But uh, the thing is that both are unknown. And uh, now U depends on Q in a totally nonlinear way. Uh, just assume that uh, I double, uh, take the double amount of Q then, at, uh, so 2Q will not be the solution for to you, then if if I double Q, then W will not not be the solution because well the problem is that I have then the square over here, so Q U appears in the equation and that's the problem. So the whole thing is not linear with respect to Q and U. Okay, so the problem is that the dependence of M um, on the dependence of M on Q is nonlinear. And uh, the simple idea we always have, think of, for example, Newton's method when we're trying to solve nonlinear equations, is we should somehow try to linearize. Um, and in fact, there's a simple, simpli there's a simplification of the Helmholtz equation. And uh, the idea behind this is that if Q, so the contrast and sound speed in the object is small, then also the scattered wave is small. This can be proven in a very analytic way, uh, but um, I'll just give you, I'll just sketch the idea here. Okay, so uh, we have that uh, the total wave U satisfies Laplacian U plus K squared times one plus Q of X times U is zero. And uh, U is, can be written as the incident wave plus the scattered wave. 
And the Laplacian of ui plus k squared times ui is zero. That's something we derive. The incident wave has to satisfy the unperturbed Helmholtz equation. Okay, uh, now plugging this in, we have that delta US plus k squared US is minus k squared Q times U. And uh, here I just wrote U as UI plus US and uh, use that delta UI plus k squared UI is zero. Okay, um, now, now on the left-hand side over here, oops, on the left-hand side, I have an equation that's no longer dependent on, um, on Q of X or something. So this is the pure unperturbed Helmholtz equation for which the Green's function is known. Um, uh, it turns out that this is the Hunkel function and I'll get to that uh, on Monday. So uh, if, this, if the Green's function for that is G of X and Y is known, then uh, the solution us of x can be written as minus k square integral over omega, actually integral over r2. But uh, since the support of q is in some, uh, is contained in some omega, that should actually be s1, I'm sorry, uh, integral over uh, s1. Uh, minus k square q of y, u of y, g of x and y dy, and that's just uh, plugging in the, uh, Green's, the Green's function here. Okay, that looks great. It looks like uh, us depends on u in a linear way, but of course it doesn't because uh, in fact u is ui plus us. So us is on the left and on the right hand side. So this is in fact an integral equation for us. Okay, um, but since we assume that US is small and uh, we have an additional Q over here, which is small as well, this is somehow small squared. So uh, we assume that we can just um, replace this UI plus US over here by UI. Okay, if that is true, then uh, we get an approximation for us, which should be something like minus k squared integral over s1, q of y, ui of y, g of x and y, dy. And now the interesting thing is that now us is linear in q, and now we have a linear dependence of these two on each other. And that means that also in this linearization, in this approximation, our uh, measurement is now linearly dependent on Q and we have a linear inverse problem. Okay, so um, this one is called Born Approximation. And uh, let's see, maybe I'll show you on uh, Monday that there is an analytical reconstruction formula for this.